When I see a dude with proper sleeves that I know, I'm like, kind of know who probably did them. I'm like, it's like a Rolex watch. I'm like, I'm looking at thirty thousand dollars with the tattoos on this yeah, dude. Yeah. I know that dude. I don't know what he does. He, he he's obviously does well because he's got those on his. You know, yeah. it, it can it's almost reached status symbol levels to some yeah. degree for people yeah. that have the really nice stuff. You know, shit's about to go down. I'm feeling something in my spirit. Chats and tats with Aaron Della Vadova. Chats and tats. Aaron Della Vadova back in the room with. How do I say this? This is a. This is kind of a. I don't know. I'm just gonna say it. I'm a new school guy. I've been tattooing 30 years. I cut my teeth on trying to reinvent tattooing. I, I thought I could, and maybe in some ways, as the years went on, me and guys like me maybe introduced some new novel ideas into the tattoo world. It's 30 years ago, and traditional tattooing, first of all, wasn't popular. Nobody even wanted a, a rose or a sailor tattoo. That very popular and became very popular later. So even make a living to call yourself a traditional tattooer 30 years ago would have been pretty tough. So we went off and did the new school thing, because that's what everybody wanted. The years ticked on, and as they ticked on, I slowly woke up to the value of tradition, and I slowly assimilated what I think those values into my work. Um, but what's special about today is this this man that's with me today, he he really grabbed hold of that traditional value system in tattooing and ran with it from the from go. And uh, and for that reason alone, I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. I think his work is amazing. He is internationally acclaimed as being one of the best traditional classic tattooers in the world, in my opinion. And uh, we're going to hear his story today and what he values in tattooing and why he got to this place in tattooing, how he broke into the industry and what he does and what he, where he's headed. So with all that being said, please welcome my guest today, Paul Doberman. Hey, what's up, Aaron? Thanks so much for having me, man. You're welcome. This is awesome to be here. And uh, yeah, I've looked up to your work from when I first started and um you were like uh a, a you know pillar in the tattoo community um mm -hmm. when i first started guru tattoo was uh it, it opened with such strength and so it's like uh there's always a, a a shop that i held in high respect so thank you for that but you know and i kind of want to circle back into what my intro was all about because i was thinking about that a lot on my drive down here today to see you because you know, I'm looking at your work and I'm, I'm seeing this traditional aesthetic that you followed. And I, and I kind of just thought like, why, Aaron, why didn't you do that? I never really thought about it. And, and I, I slowly answered the question, which was, again, 30 years ago, nobody wanted traditional tattoos. Yeah. It, it, was, um, it was like you could get fine line. That was like a, a thing, right? Yeah. Somebody, single needle work. Yeah. Or you got um, new school shit. And, you yeah. know, if you wanted to yeah. make a living, you were just drawing cartoony things with bright color sources and all this stuff and twisted spark plugs. And, and that was the hot thing for a long time. And also the guys I learned with, they were the older generation and they were from that, you know, my, my, my main apprentice or learned from Henry, Henry Goldfield. Okay. So it was cool because he, he taught me how to make needles the way Henry taught him. How yeah. to make needles. So there was tradition in him wow. from the real roots, yeah. but he was such a motherfucker. <laughs> and Frankie, I don't know if you're still alive, buddy. I say that with love. Like, thank you. You kicked me around. I learned a lot. I'm not mad. You, you tortured me, okay? I had PTSD when I left that shop. But, well, but my point is, my association with traditional people, because of those events, it wasn't just him, a few others, was like, I wanted to get as far away from those people as I could. I'm like, these guys are fucking crazy. And, and that it was wrong of me, because there was tons that weren't. I just happened to bump into a couple that were. So to me, it was like, run for the hills. Let's find, let's go to the new school. Let's let's go to Marcus Pacheco, anybody, but these guys, these guys yeah. are fucking gnarly, you yeah. know? So it was like, a, and plus again, nobody wanted it back then. But then as the years ticked on and all the new school stuff was happening and everyone's trying to fill everything with pure yellow and orange and these things are <laughs> healing and it's like, yeah, it not look as cool as I thought it was going to look. Maybe some black should have been in there. I think the whole industry as a whole sort of circled back to traditional values. And then, of course, those values fused into what people call Neotrad now, yeah. which Neotrad, I think, is it's kind of the new, new school, right? They just call yeah. it Neotrad. But what the difference is, it's it's imbued with traditional aspects. Yeah. But you're creating your own type of art. You don't have to do a traditional anchor or something. It could be anything. But there's still a good black line there. There's still the shading. There's still those core components of traditional tattooing. And I think in that way, tattooing has sort of come full circle. 
You know, I think it's a very responsible group of people out there tattooing right now. Whereas 25 years ago, not to blame any of those people, nobody knew any better, but there was a lot of tattooing that happened that was probably not the best, you know? People but are, that's my view yeah. on that whole big yeah. picture. I'd like to hear your take on that from your perspective. Well, I think because I know a lot of artists that that were kind of pushing the boundaries. Um, you know, there was Guy Atchison, he had the book, like reinventing the tattoo. You know, people were- Yeah, he said straight it. out. I'm going to yeah, reinvent Yeah, he did. He <laughs> says straight, straight out. But before we go any further, I'll go back to Henry Goldfield. And so, you know, he's a, he was tattooed in San Francisco a long time. And people- People would say you're not you're not a real artist unless you've been fired by Henry Goldfield. He was and a so hard ass. That was yeah. He was he was <laughs> he was hard ass. And I you know I didn't get a chance to to know him or anything, but I, he's a legendary dude. Mm. And um, um, but so going back to the yeah, there, like when I first started tattooing, it was like people were doing like heavy light source stuff. There was a lot of bright colors. There was a lot of um, you know, it was either that new, new subject matter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. New subject matter for sure. It was, uh, it's like now like a rose, a skull is like the most popular thing probably. Right. A rose tattoo. Um, but it was, uh, so I tried to do all kinds of tattoos when I first started, mm -hmm. you know, I, I saw everyone, you know, the drawings were like you said, like cartoony, they were warped, they were wacky, they mm -hmm. were bright. And I think that's, you know, what everyone was trying to emulate at that point, you know, is like the early 2000s, you know, or was kind of coming from like, like a biker dragon that was like really delicately done. It was like thin outline mm -hmm. and uh, so much detail. And now you could blow that dragon up and it could be a whole sleeve. It doesn't right, have to right, be, right. uh, doesn't have to be this like, you know, microscopic thing on your forearm, mm -hmm. you know, it's gonna, cause it, you can see the silhouette of those tattoos now. Right. But you can't see like the detail in, in the dragon's head and the right. scales like he used to be yep. uh, able to. So I, when I was in San Diego, it kind of got like all of these different things. I learned how to use a, a thinner needle. I made needles still. I learned how to make needles. Mm. Um, so I understood the, the configuration. Um, I learned how to, you know, work on machines and stuff. So I kind of, I, I liked those you know, I could, I could work on a tattoo machine and I got better at that later down the road um, from, from Scott Sylvia. I got to go work on machines with him later down the road, you know, but we can get into that later. So I got some fundamentals and we're, and that's when pre-made needles were like, you know, people, Mithra was selling a bunch down here. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was just a thing. So I, I got, and I got the, I got the last little bit, I feel like of, of a, of somewhat of a classic apprenticeship where mm -hmm. I learned how to do certain things that people don't really learn how to do now. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I learned a little bunch of different things, you know, some painting techniques, some tattooing techniques. And then when I moved back home to San Francisco, um, I worked, started working at Spider Murphy's and I was really, really attracted to that, uh, to that look, to, to what it was. I liked traditional tattoos. I liked pirate stuff. I liked sailors, you know, I liked ships. I liked it was those things that really attracted me to classic tattooing. And I was excited about it. For some reason, this shop had this, this look. I couldn't really put my finger on it. It was kind of mysterious to me in a way. And- um, Spider Murphy's. Spider Murphy's, yeah. yeah. Anyone that's come there, that's, that's learned anything from him, is a better artist from it. And um, he helps you lean into your strengths, he asks you what you love about tattooing, what you're attracted to in art. And um, I wanted to make something that was something that someone would be excited about 20 years down the road. Where they're like, oh, I have this cool skull. I have this cool ship. It's still there. Mm -hmm. It still looks like the same thing that it was tattooed as. And I started like, you know, thinking about colors. Like what's a color that, you would want for the rest of your life. And, and black is, black looks good. It, it'll always look good, you know? And then some of these kind of like muted, muted tones, you know, some like, a, you know, I'll go back and forth with stuff now and try new things, but it, I really liked like circusy looking colors. You know, you kind of like get your golds, your reds, your mm -hmm. greens, and, um, and then you can mix a bunch of stuff in between, mm -hmm. you know? 
I mean, I'm even looking at the wallpaper here. You know, it's got a nice color. You know, looks it That's looks your palette, good. Dude. You know, exactly. I know. It's like it looks. It's 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 awesome. You know. Yeah, there you said a lot in there, um, but I hear you, and and it, and it is interesting that renaissance of tattooing that happened in the '90s. That and you know, again, I think it had to happen. There was a lot of experimenting going on, yeah. and uh, it led us to some of the more you know, these guys that are doing a lot of neo-traditional work today, which I think is phenomenal, but yet it's grounded in traditional core aspects. You know, it's got, it's responsible. It's got the heavy, the nice thick black lines, good amount of black, nice amount of skin still shining through, and maybe one color, two colors. Yet it's uh it's neo trap because it's maybe it's a it's a wild unicorn head or something, but it's not it's not um, a traditional uh, motif. Yeah. But uh, but I just I'm just looking back on it all, and I think that phase had to happen, and um and out of that grew uh, everyone's love and your love for going back to the core core stuff, you know, the real traditional yeah. stuff, and and uh, it's still popular today, and yeah. I see why. I mean, I love it because what I've taken on has been very challenging you know yeah. to, to to reinvent every piece every time to to come up with a new illustration and a new color palette and how to position it on the body and yeah. it's exhausting sometimes dude i'm like i just want to come in and do a fucking rose man <laughs> but no one asked me for that shit <laughs> well you, you put it out there you've put out and these, like, maybe maybe someone will want to get a rose now now that we're talking about it. Like, we're putting it out the world you hear that everybody you want to get on my books yeah. i'm looking to do a traditional rose yeah. okay <laughs> write me but you put this like it's a grand uh body of work you know it's like it, these suits you know and i i didn't know that you could accomplish that and with like some of these classic tattoos i was doing at first and then it started really blowing up you know it was like now you see a traditional bodysuit and mm -hmm. you didn't you know really see that before um i think stuart cripwell and if you're listening stuart you really started something huge here and stuart's stuart works in san diego now but we worked together at spider murphy's for a long time and he was the first person i saw do like he did these legs first this this awesome dude uh, Matt, he got all these classic tattoos from Stuart and he pieced them together super like it was it was like flawlessly done, these mm -hmm. legs. And they were all classic designs. And then he started working, he got his back done and he got his front done and he was getting, you know, sleeves were last, which I thought was really impressive. But he was he was one of the first people to do that contemporarily. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't really see that until, you know, kind of it it blew up. And then everyone started getting these things. People started doing these suits. They wanted to have a big body of work that were all pieced together. You, may, you might have a big back piece right. or like a big front piece, but you, maybe you'd have like, you know, there's kind of these images. You'd have your chest, you'd have your stomach, you'd have your sides, you'd have your back, you'd have all these different ones patched on your legs. Maybe you'd have like your hinges done that were even. Mm -hmm. So it'd like, it'd have like some balance on the, on the body, but right. it, was, it was pretty groundbreaking for the time. You know, now there's so many great tattooers out there that it's common and then people are like i want to get this i want to get it now and i want it done yesterday and they're just there every day you know and they're there you're, you know every week they're coming in and getting something new i mean it's true i mean when you get into the traditional aspect there's a, probably a part of you in the beginning who's like well i'm not ever going to be the bodysuit guy that's 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 for the uh, japanese guys uh, i'm the traditional guy we just do pieces but the reality is for many many years prior to it reigniting there were a bunch of sailors with full body suits of just piece, 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 the stars and the dots that go together in between. And it's cool. But I think until you started coming up and others like you, that wasn't really a thing. If you saw that, it was a black and white photo of some old tattooer yeah. from the fucking fifties or something, but yeah. it's happening again. And that's, I, and it does look dope. You know, it's yeah. got such a cool look to it. And everything has to be a composed Japanese suit. You yeah. know, there's other ways to do it. Yeah, and uh, and that I don't know. I mean, you're doing it, and I think your work's phenomenal. And you're definitely. Are you going to be doing a lot more of that? You got a, you got some people that are covering up like the yeah. whole deal, huh? Yeah. So I was doing a bunch of it. You know, people were getting these, um, and then like, uh, like in, Instagram happened, and a lot of people wanted to get like this this thing that they saw. You know, so it was some some pieces, and um, right now I'm started bunch of new back pieces, bunch of new sleeves, legs, and then it's just kind of turning into something really, really great now. And I have like, you know, it's, it's funny, like I always hated homework when I was a kid. And now it's like- That's why we're the, tattooers, dude. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, 
probably have more homework than anybody. Right. But it's it's True. it's like a lifestyle. It's cool. Like I spend so much time designing, you know, tattoos, mm-hmm. and I think that's what I really like about it. Mm-hmm. And now now it's you can design someone's bodysuit. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's certain stuff that works good in certain places, and yeah. I feel like there's planes of the body. You know, there's like if I'm gonna do a sleeve and it's pieced together, then I want to like there's a few spots I'll start with. You know. I was like the elbow. Let's get the elbow out of the way, and people are like really the elbow. Like that's like, and and some really cool people do. Like I, sh- I would take my brother's arm, and I'd be like, "See, look, this is what we started on my brother's arm," yep. and he then he'd show people, and like, "Oh, okay, let's well, let's piece together." So that's what I want. I want that look. I'm like, okay, well, we started with his elbow. If you want to do that, and then you don't have to. There's three spots. I feel like you could start with. That's, that's a good one though, because you're right. If you do everything else, you end up with that awkward spot left over yeah. on the elbow. You kind of yeah. fucked yourself. You kind of painted yourself into a corner. And you can't put anything on the elbow. I mean, kind of, but it's not going to look good. Like you should pick things. the appropriate piece for yeah. that area. It looks. It that looks is a good. cool idea, though. The way you do, you build out sleeves and suits. Is you like I like this is different for me because I build my stuff out differently because yeah. of my style of art. But I can see what you're doing. You're yeah, that's smart. Put an anchor. Yeah. In the right locations, anchor the elbow with the traditional black rose. Yes. Anchor the upper outer shoulder with a girl head profile. Yeah. Anchor the inner forearm with yeah. an anchor. Yeah. And now exactly. you're left with these the gaps. Yeah. And then fucking yeah. little rose, some barbed wires, and this, yeah. that. Yeah. That's that's cool. That's smart. Yeah. But those are like what you're talking about. It's like a plane of the body. You know, you got you got your forearm that's mm-hmm. like a plan it's a flat nice yep. space for like you could put a lot of things there mm-hmm. anchor's great you could put a nice face there mm-hmm. you know same same with up here this is like another plane of the body mm-hmm. the inside of the arm is like plane of the body mm-hmm. you know and so when people get that and if, if i can get to them and explain that then everything comes out better yeah it's so and then people start asking for like you know they want to put a circle inside of a triangle or something like that and then like well would this fit here i'm like well no like a something more organic would and like oh but i have too many flowers i'm like well okay we're gonna fit like we're gonna try and fit this thing and so sometimes it works awesome and sometimes it could have been better but now i have so many people that trust me and they want their their body to look as good as it can and they're you know by putting that trust in me, I feel like it. it you don't comes have to sell it as hard as you used to. No, no, not at all. No, and I <laughs> got, like whatever you say, Paul. It, they have, yeah, you know. I think you earn just, that though. That's earned. You can get in there and crank for ten years, yeah. and eventually, if you do well, and people let you, they'll trust you. They'll they'll let you guide them more. They can see what you've done because there's a body of work behind right, right. it, and then you've got evidence. You know, there's like there's this uh, customer, Doug, and uh, another sip. Keep yes, talking. yes, please. <laughs> And I did some of my favorite, um, some of my favorite tattoos on Doug. And uh, thank you. This is awesome. This is great tequila. Me and Paul are enjoying one of my favorite añejos today, Chamucos. I say it every episode. I need a sponsor. I yeah. need a tequila sponsor. Hello. <laughs> I was just gonna say, yeah, a tequila sponsor would be great. I'm doing it for free right now. Okay, yeah. I got it on the table, yeah. but I'm gonna switch this bottle if someone doesn't call me soon. <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding. But yeah, so people not only has he been stopped at bars, like or like recognized in public because of the Instagram, he got some of my favorite pieces. But he was just like, okay, yeah, I want a couple things. I want your advice on the rest of it. And they they just they worked out really great. And people will come in and be like, I want my arms to look like Doug's mm. and it's a it's a common you know so he's, so, your, he's your advertiser he's yeah your, I mean it's like yeah he's uh and he's such a nice guy and just we had you know we we text we we talk he visits you know he's got he's got both arms his chest and his back done that's and, cool and now he's uh yeah he's he's that's, just a killer guy well that's that's cool and it's cool that I mean and obviously you moved to the right city for your genre it's, it's isn't it yeah. weird it's so weird to me maybe it isn't weird maybe you can explain it but it's just in california you've got san francisco uh-huh. which this is generalizing a lot okay obviously adrian lee works in san francisco and he's yeah. not a traditional tattoo artist and, and marcus pacheco works in san francisco actually yeah. the more i talk out loud san francisco has really just been a mecca for tattooing yeah. on in every yeah. genre yeah but san yeah. francisco embraced traditional tattoos more yeah. than la and definitely San Diego. Maybe yeah. not today, but you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, yeah. for sure. I don't know if your career would have grown as rapidly in San Diego with your genre 
as as in San Francisco, they they wanted it up there more than we yeah. did. It's, yeah, each city had its own flavor. Yeah, I think it's all true. mixed now. It's it's kind of blended it up did, more. It is mixed, and then you get people. You know, there's a there's like a subculture with every type of style of tattooing now. Mm. You know, there's like a, there's you know people that are into stuff that I never even heard of until some it like came out on a TV show or something like that. Mm. You know, but it's uh it it is true in every city like in LA there's like you know like that black and gray that you can't like people can imitate but you can't really get that other places. You yeah. know, and so and then San Francisco now it's emulated everywhere because people can pick up on um, and imitate styles, right? It's just a, because of social media. Exactly. Right. So they see it, you know, the customer brings them this thing. They're like, I want this. Like, I want this muted green and gold in my tattoos. I want, you know, they want this mm -hmm. thing. And so people can, you know, if you're a good artist, you can do anything, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but yes, in the Bay Area, it was extremely popular, you mm -hmm. know, especially. It still is. Yeah, yeah, it still is. Yeah. It still is. And I think it's, so the popularity grows with the customers that want it too. So people down here, they, they see that, they want that. And then, then there's a bunch of guys that are working here in San Diego that, that used to work up in San Francisco too that are able to, to do that here and offer that here. Yeah, it's, it's more blended up now. But the, you know, 10 years ago, it was a pretty clear-cut boundaries yeah. between our cities. You know, yeah. Up there was more traditional. L.A. had the Chicano culture yeah. and Mr. Cartoon and all the stuff they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, down here at San Diego, I guess, I always felt like it was kind of the new school town yeah. where everybody was experimenting. Yeah. You know, But now you're right. It's, it's, it's all just kind of blended together. And, you, and you're also right. Uh, social media changed everything, right? Yeah. You know, to, to, to see a great artist's work 15 years ago, hell, I, I remember driving up the coast of California as a young tattooer, driving to every single tattoo shop just so I maybe could peek at a portfolio. Yeah. And they would check you too. Like, yeah. what are you doing yeah. in here? Are you a tattoo <laughs> artist? <laughs> like, no, no, we're, we're thinking about getting tattooed today. Can yeah. I see your portfolios? They kind of hand it to you. Yeah. Some of them wouldn't. They'd just be like, no, get out of here. Yeah, yeah. Like, and then you'd crazy. open them and you'd be like memorizing shit. Like, yeah. this dude's fucking dope. Yeah. Oh God, I'm gonna change my stuff. But yeah, social media comes along. What a game changer to our industry in yeah. general. I mean, to the world. But yeah. tattooing, huge. Yeah. And I think it's, it's put tattooing's growth on a rocket ship because anybody yeah. in any specific genre can get up in the morning, open his phone, see the 50 best tattoos that were done on planet Earth yesterday. Yeah in his genre or her genre and responsibly without copying any of that you launch from there further forward so that's now their new new like oh that's dope i'm gonna make it even doper and then so everyone's advancing so quickly it's a uh, they see it they're like i like that they pick up on that they're like boom i'll kind of put that in my tattoo you right know? and it's like you can see it you can and you kind of know the people that 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 made something some something look a certain way and then and you see it done and then you see it redone and some people nail it and you're like oh my god that's so good mm -hmm. i can't you know like they just they hit the mark so hard and you know you know and then other people imitate stuff you can and see it's like, you can, and you, if you, you can, know it enough you can see those nuances yeah yeah, yeah you can and it, it's cool when when good artists kind of take an idea and make it even something more than it is when people are just regurgitating someone else's stuff mm -hmm. But it's common because they're like a lot of customers are like I want this and I want it just like this, and and so you can say no. Yeah, you, you can, can say yeah, you, you can know. say no, <laughs> or also like you'd also don't have to post it. You know, it's like just give them the do the service and don't make it part of your portfolio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, there, there's there's all that too. Yeah, that that's something I you know again thirty year tattooer. I'm not at the end of my career. I've got some years ahead of me. I I, I got some things I still want to get onto skin before I put the machines away. But I am becoming more and more reflective and more sentimental and more, I guess it's natural. You get older, you start looking back, like, what the fuck happened? And, and I, you know, what <laughs> yeah. was that journey? Yeah. What, what, and when I, and I don't know, I, I don't know, actually. I just know that tattoo has changed a lot in the last five years. Yeah. And I actually predict some even bigger changes in the next five years. And yeah. I'm not calling them good or bad. I'm just calling yeah. it change. No, I um, mean, I think with all all the technology, everything is going to change. Mm. Our life is going to change. So it's like, and there's a niche for tattooing. So it's mm. it's in life. It's like, it was more underground. Now it's completely mainstream. Now it's very popular. And so there's going to be changes because because people are interested in it now.
Like mm-hmm. they weren't before. You know, you used to be a criminal. You used to be a biker. You used to be a gangster. You used, you know, like you used to be maybe just coming out of jail or something like that. Mm-hmm. And now it's it's changed in a way where you're like walking in a sketchy place. They're like, oh, that guy's got tattoos. Maybe he has money instead of maybe he's dangerous. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. When I see a dude with proper sleeves that I know, I'm like, kind of know who probably did them. I'm like, it's like a Rolex watch. I'm like, I'm looking at thirty thousand dollars worth of tattoos on this yeah, dude. Yeah. I know that dude. I don't know what he does. He, he he's obviously does well because he's got those on his. You know, yeah. it, it can it's almost reached status symbol levels to some yeah. degree for people yeah. that have the really nice stuff. You know, and that's great. I mean, I think we all sort of wanted that. I mean, I maybe not all. I think there was a lot of people who would have preferred it stayed where it was, keep it in the fringes. And I was part of that. And it was cool shit. It was fun to be sleeve back then. I remember going out to the bars and the clubs and And everyone would be, I was different. It was like, look at the dude over there. He's fucking, all his arms are covered. And now I don't, I don't even notice as me anymore. Like I just blend in. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That part sucks. That's how it is. You're like, you're at the beach. I mean, especially in San Diego, you know, like everyone's, everyone's got the shirt off Mm because it's nice, the perfect weather in San Diego. And then, and then you're, you know, everyone has their front done now you know it's not it's yeah. like uh you know you used to look kind of wild if you had tattoos all over your chest and stomach and you know it's common very common know? and but, that, that that part does bum me out it was fun when it was more unique it's fun i mean there's this gritty kind of dangerous pirate's life feeling about about all and i i think that it still is um i have a lot of conversations with friends about that that there's a lot of st- crazy stuff happening in the world, but I feel like tattooers don't really have to deal with it the same way as other people do. We kind of live in a different, a little bit of a different mm-hmm. world. You know, our, we don't have to abide by the same exact rules as the regular person. But what we're talking about earlier is like, you know, someone financially sound getting these like amazing sleeves that are expensive. It's like, as an artist, you know, you want your, art to be worth money you want your paintings to be sold you know Mm -hmm. i I went to art show in la um i don't know how many years ago um but you know mr cartoon had art on the walls and it was expensive like something that i couldn't afford Mm -hmm. and you know i was maybe a tattoo apprentice or something but and i was like that's awesome because he's able to sell his art for for money he's able to you know it's it's progressed to to make it that high up you know and, and so by being able to to sell your art for what it's worth and, that, and that's not going to happen without popularity yeah point, exactly. point you're making is a lot of people might say i wish it was still in the fringes and that's fine but none of us are going to be buying houses and raising families on those incomes but nowadays if you're good and you know what you're doing you can have a, a, a normal life you can yeah. keep up with your your friends that went to college you know and and i agree with you i mean it, it as an artist my whole life and you as well it it how do i say this it, it's it's it used to sadden me as a young man to see my peers and my dad's peers and the guys that had the nice cars the nice houses and were doing well but what they did for the money seems so unfair like mm-hmm. oh you get to live in that big beautiful home with that nice car and your two labradors and your beautiful wife and your three kids and you got all everything's taken care of because you know how to buy stock <laughs> because you because you know where to bank because you know how to sell houses which by the way any of you out there that do those things i'm making an illustration here there's value in all that i i would i love a good realtor i have one thank you john for my last house i love my house so i'm not saying there's no value they bring to the world it's just that the artists especially 30 years ago were off on the side just basically being told by culture Oh yeah, go ahead, keep doodling, kid. I hope you like living in an apartment the rest of your life. So when the money started flowing into tattooing, it was, I think, a big source of pride. And for me at least, for me at least, like going to my father and my mother and showing them my lifestyle and being like, look at that. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't go to college. I I did art. Yeah. But I also got lucky. I happened to jump into tattooing when this happened. Uh, timing's every time it was a good time it was a good time right I, I feel like i got the last little bit of good time but it's still a good time i watch people that are you know young tattooers that are crushing it now mm. you know there's a there's a lot of them and um you know so i guess there's there's different good times like to mm. to to kind of get into this because a lot of people be like ah oh, i feel bad for you for getting into it now 
you know. Mm. And I worked with people that that gave up. They changed their careers. They weren't into it. Their heart wasn't into it. And um, then so it's like, you know, like, like, fuck, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I getting into? There's like a, this punk rock, you know, thing about tattooing. There's like this grungy, you know, this thing that was like, you know, awesome about it. It was so raw, you know, and now it's like, a, it's, it's thing anti-establishment. Could, it was like yeah. you were saying, I'm not a part of the regular yeah. world. I'm, I'm over not, here. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like you're this armor that you carry because you're like, I'm not like you. It's still like that in so many ways, but it's also changed. Like I have, I can support my family. It's changed completely. I think actually being able to support my family has made me more of an honest artist. I think that, I think that like, what would my son say if I don't do my best? Yeah, your son's only three and a half months old. Yeah, he's three and a half months old. Congratulations. Thank you. New Thank daddy you. over here. Yeah, we're going to cheers to that. Cheers to that. <laughs> congratulations, Thank dude. Thank you so much. And congratulations to your daughter going to college. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on the other side of that coin. Uh, I got him. I got one going to college and a 12 year old. But um, you're just getting started. You're gonna love yeah. this. Trust me. I'm, I'm yeah. in it. You're I do gonna... already. I do already. There's all these like little simple things that make it make it amazing. But by being able to provide and making art, the art has to be even better than it ever has been before. And so I, I see a lot of great years ahead where I'm just gonna be trying to put out better stuff because. It's the most honest thing that I can do. Most so. authentic, true yeah. to yourself, true to your heart. And yeah. you're right. There is that. You take it more serious. You take everything more seriously when you have kids. <laughs> it, it's a whole yeah. shift in dimension, you know. Yeah. I was a pretty silly guy before my kids showed up. I'm still a pretty pretty silly guy. <laughs> but I got I way saying. less silly after the kids showed up, you know. Yeah. I mean, a little less partying, a little less fucking around, and more like, oh, no, no. It's, 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 it's a work day. Got a, it's a paint day. Yeah. It's a tattoo day, like yeah. regiment, regiment. You know, this is a professional career. There are other people out there that, that want to take my spot. I need to fight. I need to work hard. I need to produce. I need to be creative. I need to fucking microdose. I need to yeah. meditate. I need to do <laughs> yoga. Like, it's like I'm, everything I'm doing, I'm like, what's going to make me a better tattooer yeah. today? Yeah. You know, and uh, and that's that's good. It's good. I mean, you don't want that to overtake you with fear, but. Fear can be a slight good motivator as well, yeah. you know. Like don't, having kids don't fuck up fear kind of thing. Well, you know? kids put like, the fear of God in you because suddenly <laughs> you're looking at this thing. And you're like, if I fuck, I was okay with me fucking up my life and me suffering. Yeah. But now if I fuck up, what happens to them? Yeah. Dad can't go willy nilly and just you know see what happens anymore. He's got to get organized, you know. Yeah. No, I mean it's true. I mean, like I, I would hope that my kid doesn't do the same dumb shit that I did. It just, I put myself into so much danger, so much crazy danger that that I just, you know, be happy if he doesn't have to. Um, I mean, things are a little different. There's way more surveillance over things nowadays. It's a little harder to it's be. It's a little harder to be like <laughs> as wild and crazy. But there's, you know, the towns I grew up near. There's, you know, you could take acid in the middle of the street, drink, you know, as as a 14 year old kid and. You know, it was curvy roads in Northern California, and you could get away with way more than you should be able to at that age. And it was, uh, it was the funnest, most free time I think to be alive. But I also wouldn't want, you know, my kid driving See, curvy I, roads. And <laughs> I, I'm glad I like this subject. We're kind of going on a little tangent here. I yeah. love this subject because I think about this a lot because I had a similar childhood. And the real, the the, the title of that childhood for you and me is freedom. Yeah. Okay. I grew up in a small town outside of Las Vegas, Boulder City, Nevada, a little town in the middle of the desert. And all you had to do is get in your, if you were 16, I had a four wheel drive truck. Bye mom. 10 minutes later, I was out in the desert going 60 miles an hour with a 12 pack of beer in the back seat yeah. and three girls. And I was meeting four buds at a yeah. certain location. There's going to be a keg there. <laughs> we're going to drink all night. We're going to find our way home. Yeah. And there was no way for my mom. I, she didn't, she couldn't, she was a working mom anyway. She didn't have the time to keep track of me, but even if she tried to good luck. Yeah. And I loved my childhood and, and I, knock on wood, I don't know how nobody died. We <laughs> rolled so many cars and we did such crazy shit that, and, and again, I know there's people out there who probably lived this way back then. Who's maybe someone close to you did die, but for whatever yeah. reason in my circle, we all came out now later in life. Some of those dudes didn't have the best lives and some are dead now. But I'm just saying, in those years of partying and being free and eating some mushrooms and drinking six beers and racing through the desert, I can't believe no one died. 
And that's not healthy. That's not good. That's not safe. <laughs> but it's free. It's it is free. And that yeah. I cherish that dude. And when I look at my kids, my especially like I have a 12 year old who's just starting to want her freedom. Dad, can I take my e bike down to the village? We finally let her start doing that. And I'm uh, like, the fucking kid's 12. She's on a fucking, basically a moped. Yeah. Driving down into Carlsbad Village. There's, I know there's tons of people flying by her at 45, 50 miles an hour on their phones. Yeah. And I'm like, but what, But there's a part of me too, like, I want her to have sovereignty. I don't want to watch her and monitor her and, and track her on her phone, even though I, I do track her when she's out there on that e-bike. My phone tells me exactly where she yeah. is. But, but I'm just I mean, saying, it breaks my heart to some degree that they don't have the freedoms we had, as dangerous yeah. as, it, as it might have been. You, I mean, well, because you love them so much that you want them to experience that freedom. Right. We would hitchhike over the hill. We called it over the hill. So we'd go from hometown out to this beach town. And it was, you know, sometimes it'd take 20 minutes to get a ride. Sometimes it'd take 45 minutes to find someone to pick you up. And you'd be with three other kids. And then be like, you know, or more, four with the bike or something like that. And and some person would just let you in their car or their truck and you'd be in the back and you just, you'd get a ride over, you know, and it was, we had those things. There was like, my buddy would put on, he was older, he put on the Keg Olympics. And there would be like this throwdown of, of you know, this part, this party that, that doesn't really happen like it like it used to, mm -hmm. and uh, and there'd be like the first day I got my car, uh, I was sixteen. I passed my driver's test like with like flawless. Mom was so worried. I was one hundred percent score. But on the way back to the to the DMV, I told the guy that he asked me what I wanted to do with my life. And I was like, I don't know, being safe and and like uh, maybe I want to do what what you do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> so he must have liked that, but I got a really good score. Calm my mom down. I got my car. I uh, went and picked up a bunch of friends. We had 40s and we were smoking weed the whole entire time, the whole entire drive over the mountain to this, this beach town, Bolinas, that we would love going to. And then just got fucked up all day and then drove everyone back. And then the next day, my dad's like, Oh, we got to get those brakes fixed on your car. And I was like, uh, Why didn't you tell me? I was pulling up to the gas station where we're going to get the car worked on the next day. And I hit the brakes and a bottle of vodka rolled out from under the seat and was like, how, so I threw my sweatshirt over it. I was like, Oh, I just got to grab something in the trunk, put it in the trunk. And was just like, fuck, I hope no one sees that. Mm. But that was the kind of stuff that we would do, the kind of stuff that we'd get away with. And it was like, uh, it was free. It was stupid, but it was, it was free. You know? Yeah. I mean, and the partying is one aspect of it, but the, the other aspect that I think needs to be highlighted is the ability to surveillance your children wasn't available. I mean, I, <laughs> I have a, my, my daughter has a phone, my 18 year old daughter. If she goes over 75 miles an hour in a vehicle, I get an alert. Yeah. She doesn't drive over 75 miles an hour ever. Cause I immediately <laughs> call her. I'm like, what the fuck you're are speeding. you doing? <laughs> yeah. What are you, where are you? You're speeding. My phone's telling me you're going 90. Yeah. Oh, I, I had to pass somebody. Sorry, dad. Burp. You know, so there's one side of me, it's like, I'm really glad I can do that. And there's another side of me, it's like, oh, what a bummer for her. That, Can't go 90. <laughs> well, she knows in her heart, like, I'm being watched yeah. by them. Yeah. I don't know. All I, of a sudden, you, be, so, you become the man. <laughs> yeah. I, the thing I hated, that's why yeah. I became, I was a punk rock kid, like, fuck the man, yeah. no one's going to surveillance yeah. me. No, I'm the man, right. Yeah. But I don't know, there's there's no right or wrong to this. It's, times have changed, and... um it is probably for the best that the kids have a little more oversight, you know, because you could have easily killed all them kids in that car that night. Totally. And I think about that way more than I ever used to. There's so many times, I mean, and people did, people driving over the hill, there's people, there's friends that lost a lot of other friends and family. There's so many things that, that, uh, that happened during that time that there's this lagoon club that people called. So people didn't die when they crashed in the lagoon because it was like, you know, road with like it was. It was like if you crashed in there, you're usually just like you just you're in the mud. Yeah. But it was you're some, fucked, but you're not gonna yeah. die. But, and, and and so my goal was to not be a part of the lagoon club. And um, but it was it's something that happened. You know, it's like we we did a lot of dumb things. And I look back at that now, and it's cool because you know, like there's apps where you can get a ride. You can choose to go do something different. You can you can get home in a different kind of way. Parents will always say like, "Oh, call me. You won't be in trouble." This and that. But you just try and get home, however you can get home. When when I was younger, anyways. But now you have an option to be like, "Okay, I can get. I have an app on my phone. I can get home. I don't need to go put anyone in danger anymore." 
You know, another thing, I, I, I mean, this, now we're kind of just on parenting, but fuck it, whatever. We're just going to go wherever this goes. <laughs> but you got me thinking about all this stuff and it's stuff that's been in my mind. But one thing, my oldest daughter, my 18-year-old daughter, um, they've had a few parties at my house and and I was so resistant to having these kids come party at my house because I was thinking they were going to do what I did, like I, I mean, which was ludicrous. You know, I would, my house, it's a two-story house. I bet you, you could jump from my roof to my pool if you ran hard enough. And that's something I would have tried if I was a visitor to my house currently. So as she brings over half the football team. No one's jumping off the roof. <laughs> and I'm worried that they're going to start, all that's about to happen. So I'm just on high alert. And meanwhile, you know, and we have cameras on our property so I can kind of look around and see whatever. They're, they're just well behaved. In my mind, I'm like, well, she's, yeah. That's, I don't know. I just think the idea around being a raging party boy, I know it's still out there, but I don't know if that culture is as strong as it was when we were young. I think it's changed in a lot of ways. I think like you get people like the Huberman lab or Andrew Huberman. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and he, work. he, it's, it's funny. People make fun of me at the shop for this because uh, I'm like two different people. Sometimes I'm like all about health and I'm also all about partying in a lot of ways. And uh, it's like no, no stranger to like, like uh, overindulging sometimes, but it, it's uh all of a sudden you're like, oh, this person, this like this person that knows about the brain more than the rest of us that are listening, he's just like, I thought, I thought booze would just mess up your liver. And you're like, oh no, it messes up your brain, probably worse than your liver. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of more information. Mm -hmm. I mean, when there was a time when cigarettes were like, oh, what doctors would say, like, occasionally, and an occasional cigarette could be have some health benefits. You know, and people take that as, you know, whatever they want in their mind, but they, it, it was a thing that was an advertisement. That was the way to get into it where it wasn't going to, you know, affect you in such a negative way. And now we know a lot different. And I think that we're learning a lot of different stuff now about the effects of everything, you know? Good point. You're, you're right. I never, yeah. as a young man, thought that over drinking was bad. And I, it's funny yeah. you, you bring up Huber, Uberman, Huberman, Huberman, Huber, Huberman, Huberman, I think <laughs> my wife. He, my wife owns a med spa. She's a health junkie, you know. And uh, every time I overindulge, I end up wake up with a with a post from him to me from her, <laughs> and it's always him talking about the blood brain barrier and yeah. what the fucking out. And I mean, ketamine, I, ketamine benefits and <laughs> pros and cons of ketamine. I, someone just sent me that, <laughs> dude. I I drink less now, and yeah. you're, I drink less now because of that information. Because yeah. I, I I was with you. I'm like I'm a liver. You know, my grandpa was pretty hardcore. I'm pretty, I'm sure I've got the DNA for it. But then when you get into the brain stuff, and then I have a day at 52 where I can't remember someone's name, yeah. where I can't fire off the right response at the right moment in the witty way, I'm like, oh, that's probably from alcohol. I'm killing my brain. I like how we're talking about this by crushing, oh, crushing this, but it's, it's great. I mean, I think you still have to live, but it, it is true. Like I, I have a hard time. I don't have an off switch. I don't have the like, I'll have, a glass of wine at dinner kind of thing. Like I'm either going to drink or I'm not going to drink. Mm. And so it, it kind of like, and it started a long time ago. I wanted to start this thing called event style partying because like you are at home. You're not, you're not partying all the time because there's no point for it. And then you, there's a thing to do and then you're going to go do this thing and it's going to be wild and you're going to drink and party as much as you can. And then you're going to come back home and you're like, okay, cool. I'm not going to do it for a little bit. It right. doesn't, didn't really work. Cause like, <laughs> I cut down to like, you know, like there's, there's too many events. There's, exactly. <laughs> there's too many events. I, you know, I'm going to stop you. I tried that technique too. I have remember doing it with my wife. Like, look, we're just going to, you know, drink a little too much on purposeful event. Next thing I know, I'm like, there's an event, three events a week. Yeah. There's this guy's barbecue. There's the art show. There's yeah. this. And then yeah. so and so's in town. <laughs> so and so's in town. <laughs> yeah. It's it's Friday. I don't yeah. have to work tomorrow. Yeah. Like when do the events yeah. stop? Yeah. I try to try to after that, I was like, well, like one day a week. One day a week. And then, you know, maybe two, maybe three. But if I drink less days, like it's like the every day. I never liked it every day. When I was uh, in my twenties, maybe because I was, you know, out having a good time i was living with a bunch of young dudes that all wanted to party we all wanted to go meet girls in our 20s and it was just like that was what we did we were in san diego we were like running around like with like a chicken with its head cut off you know mm -hmm. it was like it was, it was and it was fun and everyone enjoyed it but you know now it's like i mean hangovers can be kind of brutal so i was like i i like to drink hard 
but not every day. Um, yeah. And I think a, a lot of people didn't even, they're like, they, a lot of people I know, they're just like, just figured I drank every day. I'm like, there's a, se- there's a secret part of my life where I'm painting and I'm locked in and I'm doing that all day long. Yeah. Or I'm focusing on something that nobody knows about because, uh, and that's how I get stuff done. You know, mm-hmm. where I'm like, oh, like I'm not at the bar. Well, now I'm home because I've I have a kid. But it's like, um, my girl and I used to party hard. She doesn't drink. She hasn't drank in three years, and it's awesome. It's been awesome for our relationship. Um, I drink less because of it, but I so, but I'm always I, I want to have a good time. I like this like eat, drink, and be merry kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You break bread with with people that you care about, friends, family, and you get to enjoy yourself. But it's when it starts to become that problem, and maybe that's what your daughter's talking about too, where it's like, oh, he was so sloppy. It's this unclassiness if right. you're like this blacked out person now where you're like a problem. And and I think that it's better to do that less. It's better to be the problem, right? We're like, oh, we had to get this person home. We had to like, you know, call their wife. We had to call their mom. We had to call, you know, it's like if you're less of a liability and you can handle, handling your shit is, is way more uh it's just cooler to handle your shit it's way cooler but i I will say i mean on the topic of alcohol i defend alcohol to some degree in this aspect like i look back on my life i look at some of my favorite photos in my phone and there's a picture of me and my wife in paris and i'm holding her and there's tears streaming down my face and i'm in love and i'm having the best time and i've had at that point in the day two bottles of wine yes over the last four hours i might falling over can i not walk no i can walk i'm not falling over but there's just i don't know there's a lot of magic for me that's happened in my life where i i seem to can t- let go of emotions i can express myself more freely i i feel with the love for life more readily yeah. and and again i do think ultimately alcohol has to be monitored and managed really accurately it can grab you and fuck your life up so quickly yeah. and it ha- i've had some days where I wished I hadn't d- said things I said or drank as much as I've drank. I'm yeah. not innocent. But I've also had hundreds, maybe thousands of days where I only had one bottle of wine and it loosened me up and me and the wife had a great night or me and a couple of buddies had some good mm-hmm. high fives. We cranked up the tunes and we sat by the fire yeah. and I just don't want to make it all evil. And I think there no. are certain people or podcasts and things that are out there right now that are kind of pitching this idea that it's a no-fly zone. And I'm like, so we're, well, we're, we're, we're no pro fly? alcohol here. <laughs> pro, alcohol. pro management. Pro, pro alcohol management. But no, you're, you're right. You're right. Because I, I feel that way too. And there's so much, like, uh, I have a, like a love hate relationship with tequila because it's brought so many amazing times. It's mm. so much love with people that I care about just sharing like a bottle of tequila. It's fun. It's, it's enjoying to like sit and relax especially after you work so hard at something. Mm-hmm. And so, and life's meant to be enjoyed. Like if you're scared of everything, then mm-hmm. you would never do anything. And I have a friend, his name's Josh Clark. He, he's passed, but he his one of his sayings was like, the only regrets in life are the risks that you didn't take. And it's an important thing to, to try things, to see what works good for you. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it, like, you can't just be afraid of everything all the time. You can't be af- afraid to get too drunk sometimes. You can't be afraid to eat a cheeseburger sometimes. You can't be afraid to, you know, do do some just... Maybe you have a cigarette one night, yeah. even though you're not a smoker. Maybe, but there's everyone's so scared of everything now. They're like, ah, I can't eat a fucking cheeseburger. I can't have a beer. I can't have a tequila. I can't do... I can't jump off that cliff into the water. You know, like, and, and so there's that, that free thing that we're talking about. That feeling of freedom is like, you know, like... There's just water down there. I'm gonna jump off the cliff. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you don't even you don't even have to be drunk to jump off the cliff into no, the water. Oh, no, and you probably shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah, I've jumped know. off a lot of cliffs. Some tipsy, some not. I recommend non-tipsy cliff jumping. No, you're, you're right. You're right. better at landing. Yeah. Land. You got to stick to landing when you jump off a cliff. <laughs> Especially with Instagram now. For some reason, Instagram knows I like watching people eat oh, shit I jumping just saw off that cliffs. The other day. <laughs> I, I, every time I open it up, there's some lady who's running towards the cliff, then trips, then does like a cartwheel down the cliff and then hits the water. You know what I hate about oh, those I videos? Saw, I saw that one. There's so that many of so them. so fucked up. They know my algorithm. They keep yeah. pumping them my way. I hate they don't, they just end. They don't tell you in the little bio, like, I'm always like, is she alive? Yeah. What happened to her? Even better if you knew that they lived, so you're not like, oh. right. I see someone like uh, climbing, like climbing's 
you know, really popular thing nowadays. And this lady just free climbing, starts falling, falls, grabs like the partner that she's climbing with, and they both fall off the cliff. And you're like, did they don't tell you what happens? Yeah, are they alive? Like, talk about a cliffhanger. <laughs> it's, it's fucked up. Well, all right. Well, look, I'm with you. Sounds like we see eye to eye on that. And you know what? To each their own. We all got to find our lane and find out. I, I personally am a dick. I, since I was a little, little boy, in my spirit has always been a wild part of me. I like life to be a little crazy, a little wild. That's just what I am. So that's my lane. And I try to manage it and keep it within parameters so that I don't hurt people or hurt myself. And I, I'm 52 and I think I've done a pretty good job. Others, they're, they're very calm. They're very quiet. My brother, you know, he's mm -hmm. fine just living a very quiet, peaceful life. For him, not ending up somewhere, drinking too much and partying too hard isn't a problem for him because he's yeah. not even looking for it. He doesn't. So, you know, it's all our, our unique signature, our spirit. And that seems to be like you a little bit, like me a little bit. For guys like us, you know, you just got to manage it. Yeah. Figure out your own your own program. But on that note of of drugs and alcohol, you had mentioned to me earlier, a lot of people who listen to the show know this about me, but I'm a I'm a very big fan of psychedelics from a for therapeutic reasons. Obviously, when I was young, I had some accidental spiritual breakthroughs when really I just thought I was gonna eat some acid and like get weird. And next thing you know, I'm sitting in the desert crying and realizing <laughs> deep, dark secrets yeah. about myself. You know, it wasn't intentional, yeah. but still. The medicine came through and yeah. and i was getting that message whether i wanted it or not you know yeah. but but as in my older life i've done these things in a more intentional way i microdose i microdose lsd i microdose mushrooms i did a lot of experiments with dmt i i do have big plans for some ayahuasca journeys soon you gotta um, do that you gotta do that you did that yeah i was gonna ask you but my my question yeah. would be how is what are how what's the psychedelic role in your life and how has it lifted you up maybe as an artist or as a human so the the first time I ever took any acid, I was at school because that's what I don't know. I don't know why. I used to hang out with some some friends. They were they were these older girls that were awesome. I was in seventh grade. They were in eighth grade. I just looked up. They were so cool to me. You know, they were like they were the cool, edgy girls that you know they liked skateboarders. They were like they were kind of badass. They looked cool. They just and they introduced me to all this like you know, awesome, awesome stuff. So doing that at school was this like all of a sudden like, oh, that person's on acid at school. And it was kind of like an interesting thing to do because it was so foreign. We had smoked weed, you know, but I did all this acid and smoked a ton of weed and mushrooms and stuff like that. Kind of like during that time, end of middle school, into high school. And then I stopped for a little bit. It was just like, kind of became this thing where people were partying, you know, we're searching for something. Everyone was doing something. Everyone was doing hallucinogens for kind of a different reason. Some of it just to experiment with, some of it to party. And so that kind of shaped the beginning of my life in a lot of ways because I saw things in a different in a different way. Um, being so, it was like the more acid we would try and get away with taking in a way, um, the more mushrooms we would try and take. It was like uh, to see how far out we could get maybe. And then it, I kind of reeled that in acid started being a thing that took so long to come down and you get like you know nine hours and you're like okay like i'm still kind of seeing stuff and like maybe i want this to be over now mm -hmm. um mushrooms you kind of get this gradual come down it's different you can en enjoy something later where you can maybe sleep or maybe you can come down from the mushroom trip have a few drinks go to bed or whatever your your night looks like and then I had this like psychedelic reawakening in my 30s Mm. And that was, um, it was my, my brother is about nine years younger. He eight, eight years, 10 months. And we're super close. And so he, as he started to get into his beginnings of his psychedelic, uh, kind of experiences, I was like, had a kind of reawakening a, of my own. And that was more, I felt in a lot of ways, like a guide, in, you know, in the past trying to help other people with their trips, um, mm that kind of became more as I got older and it started taking like a lot out of, out of me to kind of explain stuff, explain the feelings, um, make sure that people were safe and okay. And, um, and, and basically being able to enjoy their time. Mm -hmm. So there's some, there's like a elder responsibility level to that, to that next step. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, uh, it's, it's helped in creativity. It's helped in just compassion for other people. Mm -hmm. um, it's helped just, 
you know, check your ego. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's been pretty miraculous. Yeah. No, me too. hundred percent. And I think anybody who's, um, especially people that have experimented with these plant medicines, drug, I mean, I hate the word drugs cause it's like Vicodin is a drug. Mm -hmm. Mushrooms is a drug. All right. I'm no, I'm done with this talk. Like Vicodin and mushrooms are wildly different. Okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. and I'm not giving them the same fucking title. Period. Yeah. Plant medicine is a little overused, and it sounds so hippy dippy. But I mean, whatever. They are plants, and they do seem to be very good for human beings. Yeah, and so healthy. Some medicinal. <laughs> it's yes, yeah, so plant medicines. Yeah. But I do think that anyone you speak to who has really dove a little into that or tiptoed into that water in their adult life will all tell you that it was extremely beneficial to their life. You know yeah. how many. How, how many other drugs in the world can you say that about? You know, man, that time I was taking painkillers really opened my heart. <laughs> like, I am a more compassionate guy because of Vicodin. You know? You it, just doesn't, don't, it doesn't work like that. It yeah, does. it doesn't work. Xanax has made me such a more creative person. Yeah. I'm so much more calm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have yeah. no anxiety after taking all those Xanax. <laughs> Maybe when you're on them until you, you're off of them, then you need another one because exactly. you're freaking out. Yeah, yeah the, the point is these are wildly different things, and, and that's cool to know that you've, you've, you've played around in there. And you have done ayahuasca? Yeah, yeah. In the I formal, know. traditional way, or how did it go down? Um, so it was, it, was, it was weird. So uh, during this time in my 30s, um, I'd... I tried DMT for the first time um, and we, we smoked it through a bong and that was kind of what I call it the Jupiter level when it's like you're at your, it's that the world that you see normally is not there anymore. And, and, and you're in whatever space that that is. And people have different experiences. I think Alex Gray did an amazing job um, painting it. You know, people have different feelings about Alex Gray's art, but I think that uh, it's hard to capture um a psychedelic experience it's got pretty close closer than any other painter i've ever seen yeah i agree with that um but now with i'm interrupting you but now with digital art yeah definitely because really to recreate what i saw on dmt and probably you too to some degree you need you need like supercomputers to generate that field of image you know and they see there's some stuff that i've seen online where it's like it kind of has this thing where it's panning in and you're looking and it's each little thing's becoming a new face and it's becoming a new thing and all of a sudden you're like looking at that and it's like a civilization behind that and you're like what that people are doing some pretty crazy art digitally these days you know with it so but alex gray had a had a great take on it anyways the dmt there was a time when it was this is like uh i think for people that haven't taken psychedelics they wouldn't really understand this but the DMT, it like told me that I didn't need to do it for a while. Like I needed, like I needed a, a it told me I like needed a break and then I would see it in a different light in the future. Mm-hmm. Like that's what I grasped from one of the trips. And so I had a, my friend El Manga, he came to a uh, guest spot at Spider Murphy's. His friend is a shaman from um, South America. And uh, he was like, uh, I'm going to do this thing. Do you want to come with me? And I was like, what do you, you know, what is it? You know, he's like, we're, gonna take ayahuasca and i always wanted to go to peru and take it i felt like that was the place and um that was you know in the amazon you know all the all the countries surrounding it's kind of those places that people do it and so that's where i thought i would do it at but this opportunity came and it was amazing because we went to sebastopol california and it's just a little bit north of San Francisco. People came from all over the world to see this shaman. Mm. They were people from everywhere. So he was like a he, you know, helped and created this place uh, for these people that they just cherished him. And um, and so it's it's funny though because like I I grew up in the Bay Area, and so there's so many hippies, so many old hippies, like young, you know, new age wannabe hippies, all this different stuff. It's like very, it's like a liberal culture with with drugs and all, all this, you know, kind of psychedelic attachment to it. And so, you know, but I still like, you know, I grew up as a skater kid too. If you're like, ah, stupid hippies, you know, there's just, there's just mm-hmm. things that you think you say sometimes and you, and then when I showed up, it was just like, wow, there's some, you know, serious hippies here. You know, that <laughs> they're saying like the, the medicine and all this different stuff. And I was like, oh, you know, and then um, I had this experience and I was the next morning, you know, I woke up and I'm like, oh yeah, I get it. I get it now. But the, when I was on ayahuasca, 
it's like a prolonged DMT experience. So you have the, the building blocks of DMT, which I think is like the sacred geometry that everybody sees. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like this realm that you're, that you're in. And then you kind of go in and out of a dream state at the same time. But during this time, that same voice came back to me and was like, see, this is it. And it was kind of referring back to the DMT experiences I had. And so it was this new experience. And so it was like, I got to experience this. And it was one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had. It's just so sp spiritual and so uh, scary, heartwarming, beautiful. Like I, I would recommend it to most everyone. I think that some people might not um, benefit that are, if you're scared, then you shouldn't. But it's not a drug. It's like you're speaking to a whole different level of like consciousness. There's like people say Mother Ayahuasca or Lady Ayahuasca, and I felt like I waltzed with her. And it it sounds crazy, but it she was there. There was um all the de deities showed up. I saw all of my teachers throughout life. I saw all of my mentors. I saw people like Ganesh or not people like deities like Ganesh. I saw Baphomet. I saw like it just you know wow major hallucinations. Um. I realized how to connect more with my lady, Sarah, you know, she was struggling and um, it showed me a way to, to embrace her more, bring her closer rather than push her away. Cause when you're arguing and you're fighting and you're just problems, it's, it's like a, it's common to, to, to push away mm. or to not sure if that's something that you want to live with for the rest of your life or something, but it, it showed more compassion than I've ever felt. And so our relationship was, better because of it still wow you know thank you for sharing that and i've had several people in my life tell me about that experience and different little details but the overall arching theme is always like that yeah. so consistent with so many people that um yeah i mean i i'm a little embarrassed to even admit i haven't haven't gone down that path because i've done all the other paths and I don't know. I'm kind of like you. I, I kind of just wait for some character just to pop up. Like the universe has got my back. Like so, somebody's going to pop up. The universe does have your back. Yeah. yeah. And it'll yeah. just be like, oh, I guess today's the day. Didn't yeah. realize it was going to be a Tuesday at four, but <laughs> yeah. it's on, yeah. you know. But I, I am, I'm kind of reaching a point that um, I, know, I might actually reach out to some connections and get this done because uh, it sounds beautiful. It sounds wonderful. And I'm yeah. very interested in expanding my ability to be empathetic and compassionate towards myself and everybody else and the planet and uh, the beautiful thing we find ourselves in it's a uh, it's a little overwhelming sometimes really yeah. to even accept how beautiful it all is i think that's part of the reason we put up those barriers it's too yeah. much to yeah. really i don't know for me whenever i've had those moments on hallucinogenics I, I tend to cry a lot and they're not tears of sadness it's just yeah I, i'm letting it all in all at once like the trees the flowers my wife my kids the the journey i've been on the art i've created all the characters that I've loved, the the fight, it all comes yeah. pouring in in one beautiful mosaic and it's overwhelming Yeah, how great it all is. And and yeah, you can't yeah. live day to day like that. Um, you can't walk around and do get your job done on yeah. ayahuasca. You're like tearing and floating around. <laughs> yeah, you can't. You know, right. I mean, that's the problem, right? Then yeah. you got to put your, put your mask back on yeah. and get yeah. in your car and fill it up with gas and get yeah. to the, you know, yeah. it's, it's a funny um, balance yeah. to, 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 to try to stay in that state of mind that you know is there, but yet you still got to um, go to the bank and make a deposit. And uh, you know, we are out of groceries and God damn yeah. it, there's no fucking parking at the goddamn grocery store. And you know, that those, balance. Those like kind of scary responsibilities when you're like, that's why some of it's good to experiment with when you're a kid. Cause you don't have to worry about paying oh. a bill or your rent, or you don't have, you know, you just have to worry about getting home at a reasonable time so your parents don't get mad at you. <laughs> so true. <laughs> oh yeah, my trips when I was a kid were much more friendly. The ones I've been delivered as an adult have been a little more like, listen here, dude. <laughs> you're mm -hmm. being a dick. You need to chill out. Oh yeah, you just get the, the psychedelic <laughs> get smack whipped, down. Yeah, here. <laughs> get whipped by uh, the old. So I have no doubt, and that's probably why I've, I haven't done that yet. I have no doubt she's got a couple lashings for me on the other side, but I just need to go take my, take my licks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's intense, but I was scared to like puke everywhere, shit myself. I mean, I didn't know it was coming. I hear all these good stories and horror stories. And as it was coming on, I was like taking, like breathing really helps. I was breathing like seriously, you know, taking, taking what people call yoga breath. And it was, um, I'm like, okay, here we go. And people were starting to puke. They give you like a little bucket to puke in. 
and you could smell it. it smells a certain way and i was it was you know so i'm like breathing deeply to try and avoid puking and some people was like you're supposed to puke or do this this way it expels this thing and you know it turns out later i heard people puke for you sometimes because you're so interconnected so mm. you know i think anything's possible so that that could be true but um i didn't i had a really good i took the couple you know days before they tell you not to eat certain things and not to do certain things i took it really seriously once i realized most of the time people have more time to kind of follow like a, a diet some people say six months three months a month it was like for me it was three days so not conventional but it was enough for me to to kind of hold everything together and i had one of the most powerful psychedelic experiences of my life and it has remaining positive effects on your life exactly yeah and i think that's the key note to, to highlight is i don't know i'm just such a big fan and i really see the world as it is today and obviously it's a good world but uh the world always needs improvement we 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 need to be kinder to each other yes and that seems to be the big thing going on yeah. out there right now is everyone's uh I don't yeah. know. They're like, not ready kind. to fight. Everyone's ready to fight yeah. out there. I mean, yeah. this is, by the way, a perception in my day-to-day -day life. I also go there. I'm like, wh where do you see that right now in front of you? I don't see it with you yeah. or the people I work with. But, you know, when I watch the television, the news, and all the things that are happening in politics, I'm like, damn, everyone could just listen to each other and be a little more empathetic to the other person's position. I think it'd be extremely helpful in this particular time frame. And I think back to social media, you know, I think that's part of the problem too, is everyone's in their own echo chamber, right? Yeah. If you believe yeah. in something, you can easily find 10,000 or 10 million people that tell you you are, you're right. I agree with you too. Can get you very mired in your own personal belief system. Like, yeah, I pretty sure I was right. And then I went online, I found all these chat groups. Now I know I'm right, <laughs> you know? And then you got the guy on the yeah. opposing side, he's doing the same thing. And he's so then, got all his people that say he's right too. Right. Yeah, and then the yeah. two of you end up at dinner one night and it's just two people that are like, fuck you. Yeah. I'm not going, I'm not listening. I'm not even listening to you. They're battling it out. And that is where I think, I, that's why that to topic comes up for me a lot on the show. Cause I just think it could be extremely helpful for, for us, the people, humans, but that's cool, man. I'm glad you, you toyed with that. And we're artists. And I think as artists, it's in our path to kind of um, push ourselves in those ways you yeah know, yeah you know be, to, to bring out more creativity bring out more compassion bring out more empathy be more in touch with your emotional feelings you know not push them down but just be with them like oh i feel nervous i feel like i have anxiety i feel i don't feel worthy today i i feel like i suck today like being open to be with those feelings makes us better artists it'll make you better human but i think in our particular chosen field yeah. like you really got to do that work if you want to expand creatively it's true and i think that one of the things that i one of the other things that i learned is you, you kind of you're like learning how to be comfortable uncomfortable mm, i love that statement i say and, that one a lot and it's 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 like that because i think i think alcohol is one of those things where you know it's kind of like you know i was a little, sh a little shy when i was like you know like pre-pubescent you know i was like all of a sudden i'm like oh I have a little bit of a 40 and i'm like oh okay I, I feel more comfortable in my own skin you know mm -hmm. and so i think it's just learning over the over the years that there's there's you know some of it's unhealthy some of it's healthy but it, it, you kind of have to learn how to be around other people alcohol helps but i mean doing this type of work you're talking about it's like that, the longevity of it yeah, yeah. that's like a long-term solution alcohol yeah. is kind of the band-aid yeah like, exactly. well you know with dealing with social anxiety which yeah. i have social anxiety people don't think i do because i'm such an extrovert if you're in a room with 20 people it's guaranteed you're gonna have, you're gonna spend over half that night doing small talk. Mm -hmm. You can't move through 20 people because the niceties all have to happen. Hi, Jerry, how are you? Hi, Aaron, how are you? How's work, my work, da, da, da. How, it, and, and that's fine. And that's just being pe people being polite, but I'm just so bored with it. Yeah. And now I'm done with Jerry, now Susan. Now, hi, Aaron, hi, Susan, how's work? How did that? <laughs> but when you get like four, we can get through that part. Yeah. All right, we've all checked in on that shit. Well, now hi, it's hi, hi. Yeah. now yeah okay we're done yeah. now we can talk let's yeah. like what's going on how yeah. are you how are you really what's yeah. what are you scared of how's your marriage like yeah. how are your kid like wh what do you think uh reality is are we in a simulation i know yeah <laughs> you're like okay and you know get to that, like, this oh my god i went through this fucked up thing <laughs> and then this happened and then now i'm better but it's okay and let me explain to you how it happened and you're like you can't get that when you're talking to 20 people no you can't and that's why i don't like big group parties and i avoid them pretty regularly but you know occasionally they're fun they can be fun but those are the parties where i'm tech i tend to be more like 
let's just you know drink our way through this thing you know yeah. and and laugh and and jump in the pool and we're done anyways well that's this is this is awesome so well, before we head on from ayahuasca oh yeah so the you, you met and tattooed a friend of mine from growing up he's a little bit younger than me but his name's oliver mm. Mm. All- <laughs> And so I know. Oh my God, I can't. You know Oliver. Yeah. So we, Oliver, we grew up together. He was a badass skateboarder when we were kids. Badass paintballer. I know. We, that's Ooh, exactly. He, exactly. He's the only person I've ever met that's like on the cover of a paintball magazine. Yeah. He, Oliver Lang. Lang. Um, that's it. And so he. What's up, Oliver? If you're listening. Yeah. What's up, Oliver? <laughs> dude is so sweet. He's the yeah sweetest dude. We so we um. Yeah, we grew up skateboarding together, and um, he's like he's a few years younger, but we would running into each other here in San Diego sometimes. And then he he had just gotten on the cover of some paintball magazine and was showing me. I think we played one time. Uh, my uh, uh, a few buddies, we went to the spot, and he was there, and he was like practicing with his team, and he played it on our team one time, and it was like I I played paintball twice, so this is how little I know about it, but I didn't know what the the where it could take you. And so he he told me I could take you all around the world, everything. And then so, anyways, I I think I saw on social media that that he had come to you for a tattoo, and it was because he had been told by Ayahuasca to come get his feet tattooed by you. Or yeah, something, you know, and that I was a that. weird one for me, man. I had just gotten done with my third, maybe a, I don't know, one of my big. I had one really profound DMT experience. I mean, it's like. People say you forget, and I've probably forgotten some of the details, but I I still remember it pretty damn well. And uh, I met um, these entities that I knew them. They knew me. They were made of pure white light. They explained to me that that's where I'm from, that I'll be back soon, that this human thing I'm doing is a flash in the pan. (laughs) You know, I'm like, really? They're like, just just laugh more. You're taking it all way too serious. All these other profiles, they gave me a download. They shoved light into me, and information was like... And, and I understood it, but I couldn't remember any of it. And, yeah. and I had uh, uh, physical sensations. Move. They would shove light through my forehead, and I would get a fire sensation out through my fingertips and my toes. It was a super profound experience. I and mean, I had just had that, and I'm on, you know, it's kind of sad because I kind of became a DMT salesman there for about a year. I'm like, everyone has to do this. <laughs> and I slowly realized over over time, like, I don't even really bring it up unless other people bring yeah, it up because yeah. it'll find you and I am, it does, it, yeah. and it's not my job to, yeah. to go out and sell ayahuasca or DMT to people. Yeah. But this is at a time when I was doing that. So I'm just on cloud nine. Like this is the most, everyone has to do this. And I get this email from Oliver and he's like, Hey, I just got back from South America or Peru or wherever he was on like, a, he was on there for like six months doing ayahuasca, part of some tribe and shit and mother ayahuasca said i was to come to you specifically she told me in the vision find aaron de la vadova at guru tattoo and i want him to ta- you need to get the flower of life tattooed on the bottom of your foot that's so good which i would never do the flower of life on the bottom of someone's foot it's just not my style and i it's all gonna fall out and i just have my own issues i'm not a palm hand palm foot palm dude but <laughs> but uh, it's hard to do you have it, to like you have to hey, that, there's guys that do it that's <laughs> their gig it's, it's not yeah. my gig yeah. but the, I, Considering where I, what I'd come off of and the email, and I was just like, oh, I got to do this. I mean, this is... <laughs> There's some of those emails. I just met with a person the other day that's like, sometimes emails get... Usually, I'm just... The appointments are booked. I have, like, great people at Blackheart. They book everything, you know. I have, like, uh, some other helpers that are just, like, just amazing. I wouldn't be as booked out if I didn't have those people in my life. But then there's ones I'll just read, and, and like, the email comes through, and it's awesome. And I'm, I just am like, I associate well with what they're saying. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to just, I'm just going to skip this whole thing. And, and, and we're going to meet like in a few days and we're going to work on your project in a few months instead of a few years. Sometimes the vibe is just right. Yeah. And, you know and it's it. like, yeah. Or it's like a, and so, so in that case you knew it, you know? Well, yeah. When somebody tells you that they went to some other dimension and a god told them to come get tattooed by you, <laughs> like, I'm paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> I was afraid yeah. I would be in trouble if I didn't do it. Yeah. I'm like, what happens if I don't do it? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. You did the right thing. You did the <laughs> I right was thing. scared. Yeah, but yeah. I, he's a sweet dude. That is a funny story. But before we kind of wrap things up, I mean, I don't know what. I mean, I did want to mention some of these books you've made. Everybody out there. I mean, I know a lot of people listening to this show right now are already fans of your work, but there's a lot of other folks out there who don't know about your your work yet. You really should go to his website, and we'll, we'll list all this at the end, and check out. But he has a few books he's made of his art in these books, you know, the first of which being Con- 
Continuing Tradition, then Paradise, and your latest book, My Traditional Vision, which you made with Mickey Villaletto. Violetta. Violetto. Yeah. I always fuck hard. Mickey Violetta, thank you. Violetto. Yes. Um, and that's a relatively new book, only a couple years old. But having said that, what advice would you give a young tattooer coming into the scene today? I would say to you have to dedicate yourself. You have to dedicate yourself to tattooing. And that could mean uh, different things for different people. But for me, it meant to to learn about your tools, learn about some tattoo history. Learn, like, um, have some respect for those. Who Do can't. they have to know how to make needles? They, they should. <laughs> I'm being serious. Yeah, no, they, they, cause there's different schools on this. They like, here's the thing. Like, should they build you, a coil machine you, from scratch? You should, you should know how to do things. Mm. Like you should know what a drill press is because it makes the tools that we use. It doesn't matter if it's now a rotary, like you still need a drill press for a rotary. You still need a drill press for for a lot of the parts that are used. Like you, you should just know what that tool is. There's like, you know, can you get to the destination faster today? Absolutely. But it's the, when you understand the tools, like now everyone, you know, it's like people use the pens, you know, like S Scott calls them a dill machine, you know? So it's like- it, Wizard sticks. It's, yeah, wizard sticks. <laughs> it's probably a better, a better name for than a dill machine. You know, like- um, You do but, not, but, let's just but, get clear on a few things. You do not use pens. You do not use, you use coil machines. I do, but I also now have tried some rotaries. I don't use the, the wand yet. Um, someone, someone gave me one and it's just kind of sitting in a drawer. Um, but I think when I'll get into that is like if, no one can tattoo. If there's a new pandemic and people's eyes are bugging out of their skulls and everyone's terrified more than the last pandemic and no one wants to get tattooed except these people that want to get tattooed and you can't make any sounds, it's like that's when I think that machine might come in handy for me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I'm, I'm like I have rotaries. I just got one from Lucas Ford. Um, they're they're different. I like the way that they work. Um, they're similar. To a coil machine in they some still aspects. have an armature yeah. bar where they're being driven by a rotary. Yeah, motor. and so it's like something that I can kind of grasp my head around a little bit better. Like if if the coil machine something happens to it, I know how to fix it, and I can keep tattooing. You know, if something goes wrong, you know, I, I watch people use them. It's an amazing tool for so many people. Um, I see like really really great black and gray tattoos, um, the stippling stuff. It's uh, a lot of people are using them. You know, I I've changed my way of thought about a lot of this stuff where i think if it's a useful tool use it um i don't like hate on people for using whatever you know what i mean i think if i i want to feel comfortable using the tool myself so i'm just not there yet but yeah some like you know some rotaries will like can just get a back piece outlined pretty miraculous time mm -hmm. um some of the coil machines i have can only i feel like only comfortable using those to do some of the shading um, you know, sometimes I have machines that spit too much if it's rotary. I'm like, I, I just got to go back to the coil. Mm -hmm. um, but knowing how these tools work, e even the needle configuration when it's a cartridge, um, which I haven't used, but I watch people do it, and they're like, this one's not feeding very well. You know, so there's like, there's better cartridges than there are other ones, or there's better needles than there are other ones. Mm -hmm. Like some of the solder is in a weird place um, mm -hmm. on on a needle on the bar and so if you don't have enough space between the solder from the from the tip of the needle to, or to the back of the needle it's not feeding right mm -hmm. and so maybe you could apply that information to a cartridge where like there's something off of this cartridge and the only way to really know about it is to understand the way the needle works mm -hmm. some people are just like up oh, just grab it go you know mm -hmm. which is uh you know it's a mentality that's like sometimes it's helpful to just grab it and go don't be so scared of it like mm -hmm. get get like you know with new tattooers they're like sometimes terrified to just get in the skin they don't know what they're doing they don't know how to place their hands yet and that's that's a whole thing but it's only going to help you to understand needles better if you kind of go back and see how it was made yeah you know like learn a little bit from from the past and apply it to the future that's good advice. I mean, I, and I, I, I can't argue with you. I'm lucky enough to have been brought up in the old ways. I know I made needles for many, many, many years. Uh, I built machines. Shout out Juan Puente. Thank you, my friend. Taught me how to make a machine proper. Yes, that's um, awesome. And, uh, and Scott did that for me. Yeah, you know, Scott Sylvia. He's just like, the machines are 
One person referred to it as like uh, the Cadillac of tattoo machines. And Scott and Juan um, shared space together for a lot of years and they're both amazing at what they yeah. do. Yeah. And I'm grateful for all that. But I will admit on camera, I have a wizard stick. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That's, it's a good, Franco, it's Franco a great... Viscovi, you know, Bishop Rotaries. He's been my sponsor for many years. Good, 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 good friend of good. mine. And I've been using those, um, his rotaries. And now it's moved to the pen-shaped rotaries with the battery packs. And uh, That's what someone gave me. They're like, and I was like, is this a good one? They're like, oh, fuck, let me buy it from you. I was like, I, I don't want to sell it. Because I might need it. <laughs> you have a, a bishop. That's what they gave. Yeah, that's yeah. what this guy gave. I wonder me. if it's the Packer or the liner. They have a Packer liner shader. I've worked with just the Packer for many years. Now I have all of them. But 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 I mean, for me, I as much as I I, I honor what you just said and I agree with what you said, I am just all pen, dude. I just can't. I can't hear the noise anymore. I think I'm tone deaf to a certain degree. Like if I put on a coil machine and a client talks, I have to stop the machine and say, "Excuse me." It's very disrupt. I can't even have a conversation. All my clients, I'm a very conversational guy. They, they tend to want to talk. With that silent machine, I can just work and hear everything they're saying. And then, of course, one machine, five cartridges, click, click, click. It's quick. It's efficient. It's got power. It runs. It moves. It puts ink and skin quickly. Go for it. Um, all these things. And so having said that, having said that, um, I, I, I don't judge either way. I got, you know, guys at this shop, they're rocking Cubans all day and hey, more, more power to them. Don't like getting tattooed by them. Ouch. But <laughs> I'm kidding a little. I'm kidding. Mike Boyd was on the show and he did a nice piece on my ankle with one of them Cubans and it was probably just because it was on my Achilles heel, but yowzers. <laughs> a little mo I guess I can't tell the difference. I just think that like, I don't know. I'm not sure if it's... If it's person or the machine or the i've been tattooed I'm, with i'm all joking a lot it was on my achilles and mike it's, boyd i don't know if you yeah. know his work but it's like mega saturated color so there's just no other way to get it to look like achilles that. is a rough place to get tattooed yeah <laughs> anyway. and it was a cuban so all three things came together and i'm like those fucking cubans but They're those so are true. a fantastic machine that can move ink into skin super fast but That's bottom true. line is to each their own but i do think mm. I, I agree with you Knowing those things is is brilliant and beautiful and rare. And um, I assume one day, or maybe you already have, we'll have an apprentice of your own. And it'd be cool to know that a guy like you is going to pass down the old traditions as they were. So it's not completely lost in 30 years. Yeah, I think like you know, there's a lot of that nowadays too, where people are like interested in handmade stuff. So there's so uh, much, there's so much that's, that's not. It's made by machines, made digitally. It's like... Right. Um, there's a lot of people painting on iPad now, which is like, you know, it it's like, it is what it is. But I feel proud that I paint yeah. the way that I do. You know, so it's like, a, and, I, and you can make amazing art in so many different ways. Mm. And so I think what I've learned over the years is to just not hate on it, any of it. You know, yeah. it's like, if that's how you want to make art, that's how you want to make art. You know that, what I mean? That's just, well put right it, there. There's so many different ways to do it. I think the important thing is creating, you know? And it's like, I'm proud of the way that I get to paint flash, make paintings on paper and board and stuff. And so that's just what I enjoy though, you know? And there's um, there's people that enjoy doing things differently. And that's that's good. If we're all doing the same thing, it's boring. Yeah. Hundred percent, and and you nailed it with the creativity part. As long as you're reaching out into the void and bringing something from the other side to Earth that others have never seen before, that's beautiful. I don't give a fuck if you use a dildo or a fucking iPad <laughs> or a paintbrush. I really don't. You know, yeah. as long as it's truth, it's real, it's authentic, yeah. it's not mimicked and copied and ripped off. Yeah all the power to you man and and that took me a while you know i'm i'm like you i, I all these paintings around this shop i mean a painting out there that isn't done in oil that's my first oil painting i ever did right there the original um on that wall you guys can't see it it's over there um you know, 20 years ago whatever so i i've been a uh, analog my whole life yeah but i'm going a little digital lately and i'm doing it on purpose i'm doing it because i've always stood for breaking boundaries as a young punk rock kid i wanted to shatter the the system the, the the religious system the government system i'm like let's break it all up and see what what it's made of you know and so on purpose at 52 we have a bodysuit shoe coming up and i'm making most of my piece on my ipad for the first time ever and i know i'm gonna get some people that are gonna be like you fucking yeah i'm gonna get <laughs> judged but I, my my final statement to them is i also want it to be fun 
Yeah. And it, and I don't know, maybe I just need some, try something new. Yeah. I've done a thousand watercolor paintings and a thousand oil paintings. I, I just want to try something new. I can't, why am I in trouble? You know, yeah. I'm not copying. I'm yeah. not ripping anything off. I'm going from my brain into a, a little la a little iPad mm -hmm. and then I'm manipulating it and twisting. I'm using all the tools that are in there to fuck with it. And, and it might be a piece of shit and I'm fine if it is. Then I'll go back to watercolor after that. But yeah. I just, yeah. I think it's just go, you know, just, but that's, you know, you're, you're on a more traditional path and, and your heart is solid and grounded in those uh, um, analog techniques. And, uh, and that's great, but you're yeah. right. As long as it's truthful, honest, and, and you're bringing something new to the world that brings joy and beauty, man, use whatever tool you want. And that goes over into the tattoo machines too. If you've got yeah. a machine, it's, it looks like a, you know, whatever. If it, the ink's in there and that's a clean piece, I really don't care what you used. I think that's what, really what it comes down to is like a good artist can use most tools and be successful with it. Mm. And there's beautiful tattoos that are being made with all different types of machines. Mm. And so it's just lame to hate now. You know, it's, just, it's lame to hate anyways, you know what I mean? But there's a lot of it and there's a lot of it in every industry. But it, I think at this point, you know, it's, if you know how to use a tool well, then and it applies like how you want it to, then you should use it. I had to learn how to use an iPad for the project that um, my buddy Danny Derek and I are doing. And I had so many people ask me for stuff and they're like, it's just one of those things where so many people are trying to make money off of tattooing now. Mm. And so I was like, if I'm gonna learn how to use an iPad and I'm gonna make this thing for this other person, I'm like, why shouldn't I make the money on it myself? Mm -hmm. um, which and leads, so, you're talking about the tattoo dream project yeah. you're working on. Tell us about that. So there's all these different things, you know, there's, there's different, it's, it's stuff that's been done, but it was, um, you know, people asked to do seminars, you know, a painting seminar, people asked to do like, a, you know, make something for their uh, iPad use or something like that. I didn't really know how to use an iPad. Um, I knew everyone was using one. Um, and then, uh, and also like I was, I ship out a lot of tattoo flash. So like, um, and the books too. So I, some of the book deals, I've gotten a bunch of books and had to ship them out. And it's hard. It's hard to ship stuff. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm better friends with the post office than I used to be. <laughs> it's hard for me to get anything out. But I was like, uh, it'd be cool to, you know, so many people are using reference on an iPad now. Um, so if I can make it available to people that don't want to buy any more books. Because I love making tattoo designs. And so it I was like, I could make tattoo designs all day long. I love to paint them. That's my favorite part of it. But I can do some line art. People use it um, on their iPad. They tattoo with it. And if I have that, it's all this extra stuff that I get to use myself because I can go to a convention and people can choose stuff. And I've never painted it before. It's just, a, it's just line art. So, so we're making... Procreate brushes, we made a whole classic set. Um, you know, the first one was daggers, butterflies, girls, flowers, um, and I forget the last one, but we, we're, uh, so that was part of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then we're inviting other people that are other artists. And since we're artists, we get to give our, our friends the best cut we can. And um, we're just real transparent with how many they sold each month and just let them know that and they get their e-check, you know? And um, so there's flash that's available. So you can just have that on your iPad. There's line art that's available. And then I taught a painting seminar and my buddy Danny taught a photography, cinematography, or maybe not cinematography, but it's a photography, how to film your tattoo for social media. Mm. And that one's brilliant. Yeah, you know, he's so good at, at filming stuff. And um, he's learned how to just set his own self up with, with um, filming the process from pouring the ink and your set setup done to the tattoo, the stencil, everything. It's, it's like, it's all methodical. He adds music to it. He's, um, he's amazing at what he does. And so we teamed up together to kind of build a site where we kind of have, um, we kind of spotlight, you know, our friends. We, I'm, I'm pretty like, I don't want to sell things to people. So, just like ask a few friends to do it and then kind of ask a few friends more, you know, ask a bunch of people. Everyone's like, oh yeah, I totally would love to do something for it. You know, I'm like my follow-up is like, hey, remember that thing I was talking about? And they're like, wait, what was that again? I'm like, so I don't try to push people to do anything. So now that it's out there, the site's up and going and now people kind of see what it is, they can kind of like jump in and, and, and do something that they want. 
like, oh, you want to do film a seminar of you drawing? And it's it's only art stuff. We'll never be any tattoo instruction because it's just not what I believe in. You know, I think you got to learn teaching people to tattoo online. Yes, you got to you got to learn from an artist. You do know, a real you, apprenticeship. You, yes, you should do a real apprenticeship. But also, you can be a punk and fucking tattoo your leg till you have a good enough grasp on it and try and go get a job too at this point in life it's almost cooler than like learning how to tattoo online you know, learn how to tattoo on yourself <laughs> do one of the formal apprenticeship or just rip on or, your friends in a yeah, garage fucking party tats. Yeah. <laughs> but you're like i went to a tattoo school you're like fuck off oh you know? gross just, that just nobody wants to say so, that <laughs> so yeah no and it's you know or there's this new thing now where you're like the tattoo it like fades away there's a bunch of those popping up around now yeah there's i heard one about in san francisco that. where it's like uh it's a certain like, ink that fades away yeah it fades there was some, some is it even real it's probably some, bullshit some friends uh sent me an article and it was like these people were upset because the tattoo didn't fade as fast as it was advertised <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing because they're like we oh. fought our whole lives so they wouldn't fade exactly and so that, <laughs> and so th i guess those people that work at those shops too or it's like you know maybe they wanted to be tattooers and now they're offered this thing and so now they're gonna they're gonna do like kind of fade away tattoos and they're gonna go try and get a job and pretty lame too so those two categories of stuff you know to clarify though tattoo dream.com yeah for everyone that's listening tattoo dream.com so you can procreate brushes yeah. embedded um artwork that you can drag straight into your 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 procreate program yeah work from color from expand from yeah the designs you've created other yeah. artists have created yeah uh, all in there so. yeah and, and a lot more coming great artists you know that really care about what they're doing they are providing reliable designs that 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 uh you know you can put straight on someone and tattoo that's what it's for it's for um it's to be, you know, influenced and and uh, inspired by, and also that you can tattoo it. Right, you know? right. Because flash nowadays isn't really on the walls of most shops anymore. So you know, if you want to flash, maybe that's where you get it. You get it inside TattooDream.com. There's it's a, a that, it's a new way. You know, it's, it's a new a, way. It's right. A, it's a new way to you know, because that's my favorite thing is like making flash. Why well, didn't mean sending it? You know, I thought of but, it as I said that out loud because you make a lot of flash. There's tons of shops with tons of flash. Inside yeah, there, of it. Yes, but you know what I mean. The, yeah. the 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 trend seems to be like you walk in like shops and there's just no flash anymore. Yeah, it kind of goes through it goes through phases. Where, you know where I think but, that phase is coming back. The old traditional style. It is, and people, people are like, where's the stuff that you have to offer? They're like, you know, the the studio record. Well, I can draw you anything, right? but you don't have anything you're showing. I don't want. I want to pick something. <laughs> and so, and I think that's where the social media thing kind of comes in they're providing and they have this like you know this plethora of designs and so this one's like i want that one that one resonates with me the most and it's fun dude i used to get i've gotten plenty of flash tattoos it's fun just look at the wall and be like that one you know and i you know just like i don't know i like it it's like buying a pair of shoes like but it kind of used to be like looked down upon like when you walk into a place when when i first started it was like why would i want to get something off the wall that everyone else has and that's what it was coming into and i was like but what if that is the coolest thing that you can get because it is such a rad design? And like, look at like the speed skull is a great example of like being so cool. And that's on a wall. Yeah. Well, both again, we're back to the same place we started. Both paths are great. You want to go get an artist to create a unique piece of art to cover your half your body. Go, they're out there. Go find them. Uh, you want to go into a traditional shop and just pick a rad tat and get it tomorrow. It's so fun too. I've got both. I honor both. I respect both. And it's just great that there's people like you out there doing that that, tra that traditional approach. You're, you guys are still live and kicking. I, I'm pumped. I'm pumped that you're here. I'm pumped at the work you create. I have a huge amount of respect for it. And like I said in the beginning of the whole show, like there's part of me that wonders if I should wander deeper down that road. But my 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 path took me in a more different direction. But I think you're doing fine. <laughs> yeah, it worked. Eh? It is what it is. No regrets, right? But um, before we close out, I don't know. I mean that that. What, what's next? Is there anything next? Is there anything you want to talk about? What's next for you besides learning how to be a papa? <laughs> besides learning how to be a dad, I think it's um, it's focusing on on more art. It's it's like continuing um, this path, you know. And so it's like I'm always going to tattoo, and I love creating tattoo designs. And so it's it's um, I have ideas for all kinds of paintings. I have ideas for all kinds of posters and that's the kind of art that I really love and it kind of relates well with each other. And so um, there's some there's some bigger bodies of work and tattooing that I want to take on. And um, I have some 
customers. I've kind of built this list of, of people that are really wanting something cool. And so that's the stuff that I'm going to work on next. Um, I'm going to take on those customers and I'm just going to keep on working on art like I've always had. Awesome, buddy. Well, I'm excited. It sounds like a lot more larger projects are coming our yeah, way from you. Definitely. That's what, what I'm hearing in yeah, there. Okay, I just want is. to confirm that. Yeah. I'm excited to see that. I really am. I think uh, that's that's definitely not the next phase because you've done some of that already, but I could see a lot more of that coming out of you in yeah. this next chapter of your yeah. career. You're 15 years deep. That's always a turning point. 19. In my, oh, sorry. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> okay. I had a dumb thought in my head. Eight, no, is 18, it 19 18, or 18? 18, 18, 18 years. But yeah. still, those years are, are typically like, uh, I don't know, for me at least, that was like a turning point into a new chapter. And yeah. not, not that you're changing your whole game, but you know, you're going to bring in some larger pieces, yeah. some larger work, back piece, bodysuit type stuff. I think I'm excited to see it. I'm excited to see what you got next for us all. And on that note, where can people find you? Tell them. I will have links on the show notes, but tell them live. Um, you can find me at pauldolbman.com, um, at pauldolbman. Those are the those are the easiest ways to see my work. We have the uh, tattoodream.com for all of the, you know, tattoo designs that you want to get onto your iPad. And, um, you know, uh, our other company that we started, um, Speed California, that's uh, my girl and I's uh, motorcycle glove company. If you want, uh, you know, safe hands on the road, you can hit us up there. Very cool. I might. I don't have a motorcycle. I might just get a pair to drive my Tesla. You with should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's such an asshole. Well, thank you, dude. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the art you've brought to this industry. Thank you for the tradition that you've you you strive to to keep alive. Because I do. I am from that era. Even though I'm a little more progressive in a lot of my ways and a little more wild in that way, I appreciate the fact that there's still a lot of guys out like out there like you that are really value it and are really fighting to keep those traditions alive so i appreciate that well thank you i really appreciate you having me on and i've always looked up to your work like i said before and it's been it's been an honor to be here so right on brother well yeah. a toast to that then yeah exactly cheers brother cheers boom mm. thank you for tuning in everybody i would like to thank my sponsor sullen clothing if you're a tattoo artist out there and you're thinking about you might want to do a, a shirt design or some art collaboration with the boys over there, Ryan and Jeremy, been friends of mine for 20 plus years. These guys are lovers of tattoo. They are huge supporters of the tattoo community. Just amazing humans. And so if you want to get involved with the clothing company to produce some art that might be tattoo related, those are the boys to contact. So please reach out to them if you're interested. And upon that's pretty much it, I guess. Thank you again, Paul. Stay tuned for our next one. More exciting guests on the way. Peace out.